there are ways in which we imagine that our brains work in some sense perfectly, like computing devices. So for instance, we might imagine that the visual part of our brain handles visual information the way a camera does, or perhaps our memory works the way a computer's hard drive does. I mean, these would be everyday experience, experiences we have with technology that we might imagine are in some sense uh, present in our brains. But that's not the case. So for instance, when we process a visual scene, we are in the business of extracting salient features out of it. And we might be interested in finding a face in the, uh, in the scene or we're looking for objects in the scene. Uh, but at the same time, we are in the business of throwing away information. So in the, say, uh, you know, many megabytes of information that come into a, uh, through our retinas, uh, we might be in the business of reducing that to a more manageable set of information. And so we have this, uh, as it were, spotlight in which we train ourselves on th certain things that are salient, we toss away things that are not salient. And a lot of these visual illusions play upon the fact that we can only pay attention to certain things that we deem important. And so that's one layer of throwing away uh, inf information that our brains are engaged in. Uh, and then you referred to uh, memory, the idea that we can, for instance, form false beliefs. And so um, we wrote an op-ed in the New York Times on this subject. I'll give you an example of a false belief. Um, let's see. So uh, one example of a false belief is that um, in this year's presidential campaign, 8 to 10 percent of Americans reported persistently reported believing that Barack Obama is not a Christian, but a Muslim. Okay, this is just something that got lodged in some people's minds and just wouldn't go away. And this is an interesting example of a belief that, uh, that lodges and stays. And there, there are basically strategies that we use for processing information that help us, uh, that trick us into remembering these false beliefs. So for instance, uh, one example um, is a phenomenon called source amnesia. Okay, so for instance, um, I think that virtually everybody in this room knows that the capital of the United States is Washington, D.C., but I'm guessing that very few of you remember exactly where you were when you learned that fact. Okay, so that's an example of, of learning a piece of information, and then your brain has done something to reprocess that information so that you separate that learned fact from the context, and as it gets transferred into longer-term storage, you now forget the exact source. And this is something we naturally do with information. And so, for instance, this even pertains to forgetting whether the initial source is credible. So, for instance, if I, uh, uh, if I tell you that, um, that um, it turns out that when he's all alone, Carl Zimmer really likes to play with toy soldiers. And that's not true, <laughs> okay? I just made it up. It's not true, but, okay. You might remember several months later, you know, I seem to recollect that Carl Zimmer really likes toy soldiers. Now you've done it. Okay, and so, and so that's an example in which the, the credibility was low. I mean, it was so low that I told you that the statement was false. <laughs> and yet now you've got, you know, the whole Carl Zimmer toy soldier thing in your head for, you know, for good. And so that's an example of... We'll have to do a follow-up okay. experiment. And, the, and, and, then there's, and there's one last piece of uh, 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 phenomenology, which is uh, phenomena like biased assimilation, in which you tend to accept pieces of evidence that agree with the prior view. Okay, so for instance, if you, uh, there's a study done with several dozen undergraduate students, who, some of whom were in favor of, some of whom were opposed to, the uh, to capital punishment. They had di varying beliefs on the <coughs> deterrence of capital punishment. And what people at Stanford did was give them two pieces of evidence, one piece supporting their position, one piece opposed to their position. And both groups of students tended to be more accepting of the piece of evidence that agreed with their own position. Okay, and so there's this phenomenon, it's sort of like a little valve, and evidence we like gets through the valve, and evidence we don't like stays, you know, on the other side of the valve, and we <laughs> ended up accumulating things like, you know, I don't like Democrats, and that Muslim Barack Obama is definitely someone I don't like. Okay, and so it's easy to form these beliefs because of shortcuts we use, basically, that help us survive. They get us through the jungle, great. They get us, you know, to live another day, but what they don't get us is a little gigabyte hard drive of factual information. And is there anything we can do to overcome these, these limits? Th there are things. So for instance, a really good trick is a trick that psychologists call consider the opposite, in which when presented with something controversial, you purposely put yourself in the position of arguing for the other side of the issue. And if you make your best argument on the other side, you will tend to uh, view the evidence in a more balanced fashion. Mm -hmm. And so if you force yourself to play devil's advocate, this is a good way to be more critical about evidence.